too many cameras going to have to be on. Do, do you not want to be on camera? Look, if you don't want to be on camera. Oh, I don't. I respect this man and I don't want him to be on camera, so don't. 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 Put, don't put this, that's quite a thing. You don't want your face being shown? Yeah, even. Yeah, we'll leave it to the audio. No cameras. Okay. But, uh, I want to respect your right to, to what you want. I don't want to put you in a difficult position. Um, even when you read the Quran, like, when it talks about Abraham, he says, My Lord, I have, uh, I have resided my, made my family reside in a place with no vegetation. So it's acknowledging even within the Quran that Mecca is a place with no vegetation. Wait, but in context of where? Abraham? Abraham, yeah. But again, I'm going to challenge the notion that Abraham had anything to do with Mecca. Yeah, but that's not. The debate is that Mecca has vegetation. The thing is, we have. Abraham's well, we know it doesn't. We know. We know. Yeah, it's yeah. a matter of history. But you, you're trying to argue that the Islamic narrative says that there is vegetation. Well, it mentions I'm it. You from the Quran that the Quran says that Mecca has vegetation. Well, no, I mean, it seems to be implying that people are familiar with it. Yeah, that's a different thing. I mean, it talks. I mean, I'm pretty sure there are passages that that's mention right, fish they, and they things. Go to which some of but what would be the problem? They would go to Jerusalem anyways. On the why would they? No, they wouldn't. Well, why would they? You know how far that is. You, you're talking about many months of travel to do that, to do a round trip, to go there and back. It's many months of your life with camels that you're going a lot of resources to do. Yeah, and this is why. And this is why traditionally an, an understanding and a narrative of trade fixes that. Because if you don't have that narrative of trade, then Mecca seems very isolated. Yeah, but people still lived in, in Arabia anyways. Like, if Arabia is a desert, but people lived there anyways. Yeah, I mean, Mecca wasn't one of the ideal places. Mecca, um, it's like... It's not an ideal place, we agree. No, it's, it's, it's very isolated. You know, there's a, the, the mountain cliffs right next to it, right? Yeah. You saw on my video the, the mountain cliffs to the side. Yeah, yeah. It's like, a, it's, it's about 1.6 uh, thousand meters uh, drop. Yeah, but the thing is, so, so you say it's not, that makes it unlikely to be a pilgrimage site. But well, well, I, I meant in the context of trade in that example, because Yathrib is or Mecca, uh, Medina is on the, is on the mountain. No, you said in the context of pilgrimage, because this is Mecca, and then you said the rest of Arabia is here. This is and the, there was it's a high there was a high point of it, so that makes it unlikely, inconvenient for people to come from here up until they can come back, right? So that that was a problem to have a Mecca as a trade center, because as a trade route, you said it's already from Yemen. So. There wouldn't be too many mountains. Yeah, like if you wanted to do a trade route from Yemen, you just stick on the right hand side of the mountain. Yeah, I, I, you would never go down. Because to, to take camels with you, going 1,000 meters down and up again, is a really big ask. Yeah, I still see yeah. no evidence that there was a trade route between Yemen and Jerusalem. Well, I agree with that. I don't think there was. There, were, there is. Oh, but see, the, the, the issue, of course, is now you need to explain why are these traditions of Muhammad being a merchant? Because Mecca didn't have the capability to do that. You know, it was a subsistence there, economy. There's no evidence that there was a trade route from Muslim sources. I'm not talking from... Well, no, no, what I mean is the Muslim sources talk about him as a merchant, so he's trading things. Right, so we agree at least, that, based on at least, that there, for Muslim sources there is no trade route from Yemen to Jerusalem. That went through Mecca, yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's right. So now, um, just don't want to come back to the point about Bidra, because you said Mecca is an inconvenient place Right. Yeah. So, can I expand a little bit on that, or do you want to talk about? I just had a question because. Yeah, sure. What I would say is, Mecca has been, was after Islam. We have evidence that it was a place of pilgrimage after Islam. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah. So yeah, it was. So people pilgrimage to Mecca. That's not a problem. No, no. Well, do you know how that was done though? So Queen Zubaydah, who I think comes from one day, uh, from what is Monday, Iraq. So around Kufa Basra, I think it's it's somewhere north, right? She actually builds infrastructure to give water to Mecca because the pilgrims need it. Uh, this is uh, some point in the 700s. So to me that makes sense. Why? Because Islam has developed and now it's a major pilgrim site. Oh, thank you, brother. They need a lot of this, <laughs> right? And they don't have JC coming in with bringing it in. So they had to put in systems in place, aqueducts, to actually give that kind of water to the pilgrims. Because again, I mean, if you look at Mecca today, the, the Hajj is supported by massive des uh, desalination plants all along the Red Sea. They take these, this, the salt water of the Red Sea, they convert it using electricity into fresh water, they then pump that so that people can get fresh water at Mecca. Because the Zamzam well isn't sufficient. The Zamzam well is still used, but it's on and off. Because if they were to just leave it on full, they'd just suck up all the water out of the ground. And they know that, which is why there are desalination plants. There, there are Muslim traditions that say that the Zamzam well is infinite. We know that's not true. 
Just it's practically. You just said it's pumping. Hmm? You just said it's still pumping. Yeah, it's not infinite as in, you can't just rely on it as an infinite source. It will run out. Because like, when you have a million people coming in at one point, at one, one place, every part of the year, like it's going gonna, it's gonna to acquire a certain amount of pressure. It's not, about, it's, it's not about even the quantity of the water that's in, it's about the, the amount of pressure that you can get out of it. I'm afraid, I'm afraid not. It, it is the fact that they have desalination plants. I've actually read the engineer like uh, blueprints for it. I went really deep into it. And you know what? It's foreigners who built it. It's like people from Canada. They're like Canada companies that built this... Um, there's plants in Jeddah. You know, Jeddah is like the, the coastal city to the west of Mecca. Many people, if they want to do pilgrimage, Hajj, they arrive in Jeddah and then they travel to Mecca. And um, yeah, Jeddah is a major supporter of Mecca in terms of Hajj, because it needs it, because there are so many people there and it demands so much water. The Zamzam well is insufficient. They still use it. Uh, okay, here's another thing. Do you know what they do with the Zamzam water now? It doesn't just come out of the ground and then get distributed. It used to. Now, like a few decades going back, they changed it to go through a, a, a plant that uh, filters it. The Zamzam water is filtered. Why is it filtered? Because there are cases of Muslims going, getting Zamzam water, taking it with them, and then giving it to others, and it turned out the water was bad. So to make sure that it... All of a sudden, it turned to bad water. But you see, to me, that just says, well, it's not miraculous. It's just water. It might be nice water, it might even be very clean water, but it is just water. Yeah, look into it. What Zamzam is, the state of the world of Zamzam today is a bit, I don't find it very relevant, especially to what we're speaking about. Okay, well, it was, a, it was a point to say that um, Mecca couldn't have sustained large populations, and for a major pilgrimage site, you would need major, like, large populations. It still doesn't, doesn't disprove something, it doesn't disprove it very much, at least. Because like you've already said, it's like, as a pilgrimage site, I have no problem with this as far as pilgrimage sites. There's a problem here because historically, like I said, people were coming to Mecca from all different places, from Arabia, from Saudi Arabia. People were going to... Well, I, I, Mecca is an isolated community. It's not international. There aren't people just coming there for a holiday or something, go for a pilgrimage site. They're not doing that. It, it is a community of, of Arabs that are living in that place and it's a subsistence economy. They don't make anything to then go on and sell or trade because they can't afford to. The environment doesn't suit that. It's an arid environment. The fertility rate is very low. You know, you've got to do what you've got to do. It's, it, you know, it's, it, to be honest with you, just looking, if you just get a satellite view of Mecca and just look at it and look at the ground, ask yourself, does it look fertile or not? And then, so you're going to get, and then look, where's the nearest river? Because normally when we set up villages, towns, cities, they're normally close to rivers, freshwater rivers, right? That would have been particularly important in a very hot climate. But Mecca isn't that. The, you could find an oasis. Is there an, an, is there an oasis near Mecca? No. Where's the nearest oasis? Yathrib, Medina. Medina has an oasis. That makes sense that that's, you know, you could potentially do more with that. Maybe the population was larger, maybe they could have done something there, but in Mecca you couldn't have. Because there is even, there is evidence, do you know uh, what's it called? Uh, Khaibar. Khaibar, yeah, the place of the Jews. Taif, yeah. Yeah, Khaibar North. Taif is to the east, Khaibar to the north. They had the, what's it called, the strongholds of the city. Right. Is that what you call it? Um, sure, yeah. The walls of the city. Yeah, the yeah, walls of the city. The walls, yeah. And I got you, still have those walls in the Okay. Right, you see them? Sure. So that's evidence, at least, about some of about what we see. Psychological evidence that when we talk about Taif and we talk about Khaibar and the walls and everything. Well, remember, my, my claim isn't that somehow every single claim that's ever been made is wrong. Rather, it's the central claims I find problematic, right? So the idea of Mecca as a major uh, center of pilgrimage, I find problematic. Mecca as any place of significance, I find problematic. Now, I might say something like maybe Muhammad was born there and then moved. That, I think, might make sense. Um, I'm not sure exactly why he moved, but maybe he did. Um, but again, the idea of everything taking place in Mecca is, is difficult. It's very difficult from a like historical it. point of view. What do you think? I mean, for me, I, I think it's not at all problem. Uh, it's not. Okay, I'd say it's. Okay, let me let me explain the situation. You have to get a well-established Jewish, Christian, and largely Syriac uh, narrative. It includes things like Dul Qarnain, it includes uh, the Cave of the Seven Sleepers, just Surah 18 alone. It's full of these things. You need to get knowledge of all of that in a place that is basically isolated and isn't engaging with the wider Christian or Jewish community. Uh, you also need to 
have a substantial enough population that it could be a ma major uh, pilgrimage site. It needs to support a significant amount of pilgrims that have been coming since at least the time of Abraham, if not the time of Adam. I think it, was, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't obviously a place that you think of as the type of paper, but it became a, a place of paper, which where... At some point, I'll... Theological. Well, okay, but it would have been at some point. Because the Quran, I think, makes it clear that this has been a place of pilgrimage for a long period before Muhammad. Not a long period, maybe a couple of centuries. Uh, I think it's implied long, I think it's not long after Abraham, really. I mean, obviously, obviously, yeah. But for it to become a place of pilgrimage, actual pilgrimage, that's happened way later. But all that, I want to come back to something else as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. No worries. It's like you said, the inscriptions, the world yeah. inscriptions, a couple of centuries before the seventh century. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, Doctor Alad, um, Doctor Ahmed Al Jalad. Well, he's. What sense are they going to say? They mention Allah. So it's like they're, you know, uh, or, what, mean, what I mean is they don't mention our uh, pre-Islamic pagan gods. Yeah, but you have, you, you have to look at the Quran as a, as a historical document as well. Yeah, oh, absolutely, I believe so. That's what I'm trying to do. Because the Quran yeah. mentions a lot of a lot of idols. So it mentions yeah. Bad, 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 bad. Oh yeah. Well, Quran. you can find those names uh, in the like the third century. You can find them in the Hejaz yeah, in the third century. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, but then they die out. So for hundreds of years, the, uh, we do have inscriptions for of that period, of that place, they were able to mention Allah. So it seems as if whatever context Muhammad came to, it was a largely monotheistic context. Yeah, but then it wouldn't make sense for the Quran to condemn the atheism and the thing. Well, now here's how... Now, this is an interesting thing. I think there are certain parts of the Quran that, using the traditional standard Islamic narrative, it doesn't make sense. So I'll, we look at Surah Al-Maida 82. And it's, yeah, yeah, it's basically, it says, oh, pray for, 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 for Sorry, sorry, no, no, sorry, bro, sorry. Why Muhammad stopped following Jesus? Well, let's just, let's go, let's go. But anyway, no, it's not, no, it's not. I don't know if you know Ian, I'm his cousin, and he said you're very knowledgeable, but he wasn't enough for me. Thank oh, you. Right, so, yeah, thank you. What's your name? Uh, Jeff. Jeff. Nice to meet you, nice Jeff. To meet you, oh, God bless. Um, so, yeah, it says, um, you will find that those with the greatest enmity towards you are the Jews. And, and, and this is the interesting word, and uh, I think it's the word is Mushrikun. Basically, the polytheists. Hey, hold on, 582. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this verse has always been a verse that, to me, I, I've always struggled with. Because it doesn't seem to add up to me. Yes, exactly. It doesn't add up to what you're saying. To, to well, no, no, no. I'm looking at it through Islamic eyes. I'm trying to think of, okay, well, I know what the Quran claims to do in these places, so this must work with this. Uh, but it doesn't. So let's read it and let's see what happens. Because it says, you will surely find the most intense of the people in animosity towards the believers of Jews and those who associate with the Ah, uh, okay. Yep. You will find the nearest of them in affection to the believers, those who say we are Christians, that is because we are uh, Christians amongst them because okay. they're not arrogant. So, the thing that makes finance out bizarre to me is the association, the associators, the Mushrikun, aren't those Christians at that period? It, wouldn't that be Trinitarian Christians? Uh, no, the, here, this one is talking about it's referring not to the Christians because obviously it's saying those that. But it says associators. The, the Quran makes it clear and it uses that term to describe when it us. It talks about associate. When it talks about Muslim, we're usually talking about the pagans. It doesn't use that word for the Jews and Christians. Yeah, but my point is, is it uses the term associators, I think in other verses, about Christians who believe that God is three. Really? I find that very bizarre then. I find that very bizarre. This is the word kufr, as in disbelief for the Jews and Christians, but it doesn't use the word Muslim. Because even despite the fact that they do commit shirk theologically, the Quran makes it... Right, and how do you commit shirk though? You associate. Again? How do you commit shirk? Is it not through association? Yeah, but the Quran makes a distinction still between the Christians and the pagans because the pagans, obviously, as you can imagine, they, they are. Sure, sure. Them. So they are called Mushrikun primarily. Right. Okay, okay so, so here's an interesting thing. Sorry to, to jump in. In that second part of the verse, when it talks about the Christians, the word that used there in Arabic is, is Nazara, I think it is. Always, always used Nazara, doesn't it? That's technically not the word for Christians. The word for Christians is more like a Masih or something. Huh? The word for Christian in Arabic is something more like Masih or something. 
that's, that's modern. That's modern. Now. Okay. Well, the, the reason I put this out is because the word Nazara just basically means literally uh, a Nazarene. Yeah. Well, you see, what's interesting is in historical terms, we have accounts of people who are called Nazareans yeah. who are judo, uh, judo Christianizers, basically. Yeah. And our church fathers write about them. And this thing covers people like the Ebionites, it covers people that are alternative groups that are not part of the church. So I'm wondering if a better way of looking at this is actually the Quran is saying, those that you will find greatest enmity is the Jews, because I think the Quran does actually condemn rabbinic Jews quite strongly, and the associators, i.e. Trinitarian Christians, but you will find those that you, are, that you find uh, easiest to get on with are those who call themselves themselves Nazarenes, because there's a particular group called the Nazarenes. No, but the, 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 the reason that one makes sense is because the Quran always calls the Christians Nazarenes. The, the, the problem I have with that though is that so, it seems quite clearly though that anyone that says that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by the Quran's own understanding, you look, look at Surah 4, Ayah 171, is uh, an associator. There is no person that says that the Christians are but, No, I'm pretty sure if we go through this, we can find things that say anyone that says, like, uh, G uh, Jesus is the Son, has a so why, why is that condemned? It's because it's associating the Son with the Father. Right. So what associating. Is the Quran makes a distinction, even despite the fact that that is shit. But it makes a distinction between the pagans because that's obviously the, the highest step of shit. Yeah. The distinction between those and the Jews and the Christians because they are opposed to the truth of the pagans. Okay, let, let's so take let's take your interpretation of the verse. So those who have the highest enmity are the Jews and the polytheists, but you will find the least with the Christians. But historically, that wouldn't have been the case because if they, they would have encountered so many Christians from. Ethiopia, from Egypt, from Syria, from Yemen, who would have been Trinitarian Christians. Yeah. But the Quran condemns them very clearly as those who are associating. Where's the contradiction there? So you're saying. Well, no, no, my point is, it's just a weird thing to think about because. I mean, they're saying that they're close and. Uh, what's, what's the word? Close with affection. That, that's not a contradiction. Well, it, it's a very weird understanding, though. You're, basically, you're say, the, the Quran is saying you're going to have difficulties with the Jews and the polytheists. And those that you're going to be having a much easier time getting along with are the Christians. But the Quran also tells you these Christians believe in three gods. Well, so what's the problem? The gospel does the same thing. But, but no, what I mean is, like, if, but, there is no contradiction yeah. between condemning something theologically and saying. I'm not saying it's a contradiction. I'm saying it's just a very difficult passage to get your head around. Well, I mean, there are other examples of this, right? There's a, there's a, a verse in the Quran where it says it's not permitted for Muslims to marry polytheists. Okay, there's also another verse in the Quran that talks about those who are um, say, saying three. This is 4171, I think. Those who say three, they should stop because you're associating with Allah, which is a form of polytheism. The Quran in Surah 5, I, 5, I think it is, or 4 or 5, says um, it's permissible for a Muslim man to marry a Christian. So, how does that work? You're, you're, it's not permitted for you to marry. Muslim, uh, to marry polytheists. Christians who say Trinity are polytheists, you can marry people of the book who are Christian. Because of the same thing that I've said, because the Mushrikun, the, the Shirk, the people that are called Mushrikun is basically referring to the pagans, because they are the highest level of Shirk. Whereas the Jews and Christians get a better treatment because they are close to the truth, that's what I'm saying. But, okay, so now think of this weird scenario. That's how it works. What you can basically do is, the Quran is basically saying, if you meet a polytheist who's not of the book, who believes there's two gods, right? That would be worse for you than a person of the book who believes, according to the Quran, in three gods. No, but we understand that the Quran is telling you it's permissible to marry that person who the Quran believes is believing in three gods, but it's telling you it's forbidden for you to, be, to marry a pagan who believes in two gods. I'm not saying this is necessarily a contradiction, I'm saying it's just a very weird way of doing it. The, the Islamic perspective, yeah. The Islamic paradigm is basically that Surah 5 just abrogates what it said before. But if it abrogated it before, what was the point of revealing that verse? The verse was only there for like a few years. What was the point of it? Oh, uh, okay, so there's five, I think it's ayah four, so Surah Maida ayah four or five is the final one where it says it's permissible for Muslim men to marry uh, people of the book, women, uh, yeah. And then there's, I think it's in Surah Baqarah, I need to find the verse, but it basically says it's not permissible for Muslims to marry polytheists. And then a, I don't think it's well, I'm pretty sure the normal Islamic perspective is that 
Uh, so I made I of four or five. I brigade that verse. Oh, I've heard of. Well, well, yeah, but the majority of them would have been Trinitarians, and that's why historically it's very problematic. Well, I mean, if that situation are right, well, what I'm saying is, if you just look at it logically, the Quran says don't go with polytheists. The Quran says those who associate with our like the Christians who say there are three gods, that's association. That's bad. That's multiple gods. Because actually, yeah. Um, Surah Al Maidah 116 is that hypothetical conversation where Allah says to Jesus, Did I tell you to take Allah, yourself, and Mary as three separate gods? So, yes, it does accuse the Christians, the Trinitarians, of believing in three separate gods. We've not made that one. Like That's fine. Part of the Muslims. Mm -hmm. the Muslims. What do you mean by that? Then? You know, you said the Mushrikun. Mushrikun, right. Oh, yeah. Did you listen to this basic thing? Oh, okay. Yeah. But there's a part of the Mushrikun. So it's, it's basically it's just a very easy concept. I don't understand. No, no, it's, it's because if you just look, if you just reason the verses out, it's not. You can't be with polytheists. Jesus, uh, Jesus is asked by Allah, did you, did I tell you to take yourself, Allah, and Mary as three separate gods? And then through a five, I have four to five. It's permissible for Muslim men to take females from the people of the book. So you now have a weird situation where it's not allowed for a Muslim to take a, fem uh, to take a female who is a pagan that believes in two gods, but it's permissible for them to take a person of the book who's a trinity believer who supposedly believes in three gods. Well, I mean, it, it just shows you that something's gone wrong here somewhere, I think. The irony is that you're trying to make actually a weird case by trying to argue that believes in two pagan gods is better. Well, it's not me that's doing it. I just read the Quran verses and I'm like, hang on, am I getting this right? Is it saying this and then saying this and saying this? And the way the Muslims acknowledge it just say this, they just take a different interpretation about what's going on. And I say, whatever's going on, it's weird. Well, yeah, they, 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 Jesus is asked, do you, they tell you to take three separate gods? Yeah, but see, see that's, that's a different... You can't find that verse. It seems, it, wait, wait. It seems to me that the term associator is very clearly applied to Trinitarian Christians in the Quran. Well, we're going to have to give you an example because I'm telling you right now, there is no, we're not going to find this. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to show you 5116, but I don't think it has the words associator in, it, in that particular verse. No, I'm telling you right now, there is no birth of all those Christians that Jews associate. So, that, that basically makes it very clear because it's not, there is no inconsistency. Let's do some homework. Let's both go back home and look to see if the word that means associator is ever applied to Christians. I've done that myself. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sort of half and half about it, but I'll go home and I'll check. I know, I know it sounds a bit weird because we've got a certain idea of it, but... I'm well, even from the Quran's perspective, it kind of makes sense, right? Because Trinitarians are associating according to the Quran. Yeah, they are associated. Yeah, so it would make sense they're called associates. But they're not. But they're not. So, okay, we'll, we'll go and we'll go and check. All right, anyway. It's a special category. Anyway, that's something I found interesting lately. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to bring back to? Um, uh, a proto form of Arabic, yeah. Because Arabic, uh, it, the, the Arabic the Quran is written in is Northern Arabic, and it, it comes from a Nabataean form of Aramaic. So it takes that and then evolves from that into Arabic that we have today. And this, of course, wasn't fully finalized until a little bit after Muhammad. And this is why Uthman didn't write his codices with the vowels and the, you know, so on. Many, many times later, yeah. So even similar with Arabic, you can apply the same thing. You can say where, do you, where, do you, where do you believe Arabic like existed long before Muhammad? Well, I know you that you you probably do for other reasons, but like, do you think I don't it was? Know how long it existed before, but all I'm saying is you're, you're saying wow. Uthman did not apply the critical marks in his time. Well, that, that's evident, right? That, that means that Arabic is a new language, and I'm saying that's not an evidence because if you get if you apply the same thing to Hebrew, that's going to mean that Hebrew was something that's invented. No, okay, okay, maybe it's maybe the issue is with the term new language. It isn't a fully developed language. 
in the same way the Hebrew was still undergoing development of vowels for a long period. Vowels did not mean that they add. Because vowels, but then again, the first of grammar rules and writing comes after the languages of the Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so that does, that's not that. The Qur'at, wait, wait, but what I'm trying to get is, with the Qur'at, where there are ayat of differences, it's usually only, usually, two are possible things it could be. It could actually be a lot of other things, but they don't pick those because it wouldn't make sense at all, or it would be blasphemous, or it would contradict. So they, they know it can only be this or this, but there's different, and this is why there's so much uniformity, because everywhere knows, in Arabic, it can only be this or this in the context, which is why there's uniformity. But it's not complete uniformity, because again, it can be two things. So some imams from some places went with this reading, some imams went with this reading. No, but with a lot of them, it's not, it's not as simple as can, can I ask, it yeah. things. It can be way longer. Uh, I've never seen more than four on a single ayah. If you should, should be more than four. I have to see for myself, but as far as I know, it could be, it can be way And the fact that... Not reasonably though, not like... I mean, you could. And, and still have it make sense. I'm not talking you can have it in a different way and have it completely make sense. Because then, right. that's besides the point. But I'm saying there could be more ways that could actually make sense, but we don't find it to be those. Well, I trust the Islamic uh, scholars when they say, you know, it can be read in these different ways, and there's disagreement about it. I just accept what they say. Um, you look into it. Like, you know, I spoke with Fadel Soliman, and he seemed to imply most of the time it's only like two per ayah. Sometimes you might see three, sometimes four, but that's kind of about it. Four possibilities. It, so, so for the same ayah, it could be read according to four different readings. Okay. But you just said so, 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 so. Yeah, mostly it's two. Per, per ayah, mostly. Yeah, like this is why Christians and non-Muslims will say, in the Walsh it says this, in the Hafs it says this. And that's because there's only those two. Like, like, because, because technically the Hafs, uh, Dolly agrees with Hafs, for example, so does X, Y, and Z. And then maybe Walsh is the outlier. Or maybe it's Walsh or some other one that have the, the other reading. You see? For example, I'm still just thinking, trying to think of something. Like, for example, the Surah 2, Surah 1, Surah 4. The owner of the four, yeah. You can actually even read it in a way that says, he owned the Day of Judgment, as in the, in the past. So, for example, instead of Maliki or Malik, you can say Malika, and it would mean that he owned the in the past and in the right. present, like in the present continuous. Yeah. The Day of Judgment, but we don't find that. That's just. It's an example I think I just thought of from the time. Um, well, the past tense is, is difficult because. Because, yeah, technically in the Quran, a lot of things that are translated in the present or thought of in the present are actually uh, technically in the Arabic they're posed in the past. But that doesn't mean that Muslims think they're in the past. They just accept that as a style of writing. Yeah, it's a style of Yeah, very... Fadel Soliman talks about this. One of the things he did with his translation is he was saying, I want Muslims to be aware that actually in the translations you read, it often presents it in like present English when technically the Arabic is saying it's past tense. And so he, he wanted to make that clear. But he doesn't think that means theological difference. He just thinks that's uh, you know, a, a form of like beauty in the Quran. That's how he would say it. Yeah. Well, if you want to look at that way, fine, you know. It's not very hard to understand. I understood this as a child. You have the writings of Muslims who are in different places writing how they have the Quran with them and they are aware that in a particular verse, the, they are aware that their brothers in Mecca, the, the brothers in Medina or Damascus, they recite it slightly differently. The early Muslims, were, the early Muslims weren't like a failure. They, they, they embraced the fact that they knew there were variants. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we know this. Which is good. Like, it's good that they, 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 they didn't hide that. They were honest about it and said, "We are aware of these things." You see, how I would do that as a Muslim is I would abandon the idea of a perfectly preserved textual Quran. I would say that's not possible. Well, that's because the thing is, we've always had the, in the pair of the two narratives of preservation and all sorts of different things like that. Because even me, I'll be honest, I wasn't brought up in the West, but when I, was, when I came to the West, I was surprised to see that the Kira had as many stories and topics as it was in Tunisia. For example, yeah. Amphalite, everybody knows about the Kira in Amphalite. Even when you see the, the story of how I talk about that, about the Kira in what I take from that story is very different from what everybody takes from the story. Wait, when you say the story of how they found out about the Kira, what do you mean by that? I do. Oh, Hatun! Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about Islamic uh, hadith. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She was surprised. She was surprised. But my, my point is, what I see from that is the fact that he asked her that demonstrates that he asked that to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's common knowledge to everyone. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not saying that like there are there are parts of the world where this is known. No problem. But in the Western world, it's yeah, not known. Yeah, 
that's, that's Trust me, I can, I can tell you, I, I have spoken to so many Muslims that just aren't aware of it. And what's worse, to me anyway, is when they are told it by Muslims, the Muslims often lie to them about what it is. They tell them it's just dialects. Yep, a lot, like, come on, a lot of it is dialect. Well, a lot of it you may say is um, differences between uh, past and present tense. You may say a lot of it is um, like you and they and stuff like that. That's fair. A but to say, right, but there, I've seen that myself. But a lot of it is also actual changes in words. Most of them are dialects, I agree. But there is some of them that are Right, but it's not fair to say like they're just dialect. Because it, it's basically trying to imply there's no real difference. But in reality, there is a difference. If there was no difference, Muslim scholars wouldn't have cared. They wouldn't have documented it. It would have been like, why? It's the same thing. Yeah, I think, yeah. It's even when you read, even when you read like the, the early works, a lot of it is, is explained as the dialectical differences. And they still acknowledge that there are. No, they, they, do, they do acknowledge it. I mean, remember, even the Hadith acknowledge it. This is what I thought you were perhaps alluring to. You know, Surah Al Fuqan and uh, Hisham and uh, Umar Al Kitab. They argued about the recitation of chapter 25 of the Quran. The only way I think that could have happened is if there were actual differences at some point in the recitation. Because otherwise it makes no sense, does it? Yeah. Yeah. And you can say, well, that's the Aruf. And that's usually, I mean, the Hadith actually says at the end of it, Muhammad explains, this is the seven different modes. These are the seven ways the Quran is revealed to me through Jibreel. Yeah, because here's the thing as well, right? Because the Arabs at the time, there, there was a lot in the diagram, in the, what's it called? In the, in the, in the, in the, in the Different dialects, the dialect, dialectic differences. Yeah. Among them was different grammar. So some of them would use slightly different grammar than the others. So someone can look at that and say, oh, there was a difference that was that affected the meaning or whatever. Yeah. It was a different word. But, and you could dismiss it as a dialectical difference, but really it is actually a dialectical difference because people use different. Are you still talking about the same story though? Are you still talking about Hisham, uh, Anumar al Khattab, the second caliph, when they argued about? The recitation. I'm more thinking about the story of Ubay. Do you know the story of Ubay? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. There's another story where Ubay Kaf takes two other men, two more men, to yeah. the prophet. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, so, yeah, what I want to say is, you know the Umar bin al Khattab and uh, Hisham bin, Hali bin Hakim, I think his name is, they're both from the tri same tribe of Quraysh. So they wouldn't have spoken different different terms. They would have spoken. They're, they're both from the same tribe of Quraysh. Uh, Umar, uh, Umar and Hisham bin, bin Hakim, I think his name is. He's the other guy. That's in the hadith where um, I can't remember who it is. Hisham bin Hakim, said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check it up. They're from different uh, clans. Uh, one is Banu. I can't remember the clans. I don't know if it's Banu, Banu Hisham or if it's a different one. He was born in Kufa, Iraq, died in 818. Wait, what? This Eight? is not the guy you're talking about. No, 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 no. no. Uh, who's this guy? Hisham bin Hakim. No, it's Hakim. 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 I don't know if it's Al Hakim or Hisham. Because that's not Hisham bin Hakim. Uh, Ah, oh, he's from Quraysh, yeah. He's a companion, okay. he's the son of a companion. Yeah, so it's him and, and it's... He embraced Islam in the conquest of Mecca, isn't he? I think so. So, so that story is pretty late then. Uh, well, it's a sound Sahih Hadith, but... I mean, this is one of the ways that you actually infer the Aruf, because this, this narration goes on to talk about the Aruf. Yeah. Right. And I mean, I, mean like, I don't know, have you looked into the Aruf? Because from my point of view, it's impossible to derive either the ten kilaat or the presence of more than one roof today. I don't think we can, from an from evidence point of view. From what? To establish uh, so, Yeah, yeah. Well, let's start, let's start with the ten kilaat. Can you show me anything from the Quran or the Sunnah where the ten kilaat are endorsed by Muhammad? Yeah, you just call the hadith. You just cite the hadith of Umar. Right, that's the roof, right? Yeah. But I'm talking about the kilaat now, just in this context. There is now ten canonized kilaat here. Yeah? And then you have the two transmitters for each one and so on, but... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, right. so you have in the Hadith of Ubay, right? Yeah. He says, one man came to pray and he prayed with one kira. Right? He used the word kira. Does he? Yeah. In the Hadith? Yeah. That's interesting. I'm telling you, right and another man came and he prayed with another kira. And then, so I took them both and brought to the Prophet and had the conversation with them. Okay. And then he was told that I was given seven hours. So yeah, that, yeah. That to me tells me yeah. that the Quran are the part of the Aruf. Okay, first of all though, can you show me what the Aruf actually are? Based on 
No, I would say they are the Qur'an. They are the same thing. But then there's 10 Qur'an. So how do, you, how do we go from 7 Aruf to 10 Qur'an? Is it, is it divided into parts? And, and like... No, that's easy because if you have two, two Aruf, for example, yeah. and then for one verse you take one Aruf, and then for another verse you take the second Aruf, then all of a sudden you can, you can produce about four, four Qur'an based right. on two Aruf. But how do you know that A, 10 is the correct number that you were meant to get to, and B, how do you even validate that the Aruf are in the Qur'an? There is more than 10. Well, when you include the transmitters and so on, sure. I'm just talking about the actual. Yeah, about actual Qur'an that were in the time of the Qur'an, there was about 30. And then it was Yeah, about yeah, that, that, that is true, there was. Um, I mean, that to me raises another problem. In the early period, there was a lot of different forms of recitation of the Qur'an that are not accepted today. Yeah. And how did that happen? Yeah, because here's the thing, right? So in the time of Abu Bakr, there was no, there, this was a problem. In the time of Umar, this wasn't a problem. This started to become a problem in the time of Uthman. So Abu Bakr does his codex based on one problem. The problem is because of the people who recite the Quran have been dead. And um, by, well, thank God that he comes to me and he asks me these questions because it gives me a chance to talk to him. So I have a lot of patience for, for that man. But anyway, God bless you all. Take care. Thank you.